Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, great pleasure in welcoming you to the session on uh, adapting to new champions. Uh, I think we have several uh, companies here uh, which are uh, champions in their own countries and uh, making moves in other countries. And uh, let me start. Uh, on my left, we have uh, James Riadi, the CEO of the Lipo Group. Uh, Lipo Group spans uh, the Asia Pacific Rim from Indonesia, going on to Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, China various types of businesses. This next is Smohamed uh, al Girgawi, uh, who is the Executive Chairman and Chief Executive of uh, Dubai Holdings. Uh, I would probably better describe him as uh, one of the architects of uh, the new Dubai, what we see today, a place where we all allowed to go and work and build businesses. To his left is uh, uh, Alexander, Alexander uh, Izosimov, I always call him Alexander, uh, CEO of Wimplecom, a company that I have greatly admired, a uh, telecom company, a cell phone company, and a brand name Beeline in uh, Russia and in uh, neighboring uh, countries. To his left is uh, Emilio. Uh, Emilio is the CEO of uh, what is the largest media company in the Spanish-speaking world. And uh, he will share his story as you go. And to his left is uh, uh, my friend uh, Aditya Mittal. Aditya Mittal is the CEO of, CFO of Arcelor uh, Mittal. And uh, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Roswith Moskanter. And we were just discussing uh, you know, what is each one's role. And I said, you need to uh, probably at times show us reality, you know, do a reality check for us. Because uh, probably the stories that uh, we hear here uh, could get us uh, to be carried away. So uh, without much ado. I would uh, like to start in alphabetical order and request uh, Emilio if uh, you would like to uh, start off. Thank you. We were discussing uh, earlier or, or of the way what was an old champion and a new uh, champion, and I believe that uh, the common denominator here of, the, of our stories is that we come from countries that have not been on the, on the developed world for many years, we're actually on the developing world, and I believe that being there uh, and suffering, in our case, in Mexico, the region, Latin America, the economic crisis is that, that, that we suffer for the last 30 or 40 years, make us go, go out of our countries, go out of our borders. And in our case, the advantage that we have is that we have a common language from the United States that is right now the largest and fastest growing Spanish speaking market in the world until Argentina and then obviously Spain. That made uh, our creativity grow uh, to try to produce in our case the, the best programming that we have and compete around the world uh, with the big guys because at the end of the day uh, what we do and when we program in one channel or when we sell our programming to a channel outside of, of our region, the day only has 24 hours and it's only one channel. So if we get the slot at 6 p.m., you, uh, you take out all the other uh, competitors. And there are competitors, obviously local in all the countries, obviously uh, from international places, big producers like the ones in the States and obviously in Europe. So I believe that uh, what has happened in this, in this world is taking the opportunities that we have had, taking them really outside of our borders, try to grow our businesses. Our, our model right now is our revenues around 30, 35% of the revenues come uh, from, outside of Mexico, from outside of Mexico, and we want to take that for 50 or 60%. And like I was saying, take advantage of new opportunities in the States and in other countries. We are. Uh, we were discussing yesterday actually uh, with Alexander in a, in a meeting that we had about uh, uh, telecommunications and about all the, the subscribers that he has in Russia and now we are co-producing our programs in Russian with Russian actors and suddenly we can build in into new technologies like the mobile phones that are capable of bringing video to produce new, new ideas. I believe that, that the stories that, that you're going to hear and that I have heard, that I have learned a lot, that has have that common denominator that we need to, to grow outside and that we believe uh, because of the way our, our developed, all the developed countries were in, uh, at a time that we need to go out and that we need to, to try to, to convince 
uh, other people that are the products that we deliver, that the products that we, that we do are, are great quality. Thank you, uh, Emilio. You need to go out. We'll come back to that. Uh, as to what are the challenges you face as you go out, I think will be very interesting to hear. But I would uh, like uh, Mr. Algargavi to tell us uh, the story of uh, Dubai, because that is an amazing story. To me, it is a, a five-year story of transformation. Uh, I have seen Dubai five years back, and I continue to see it today. Salgargawi. Thank you. That's a long story, by the way. We'll try to make it short. I think, I think when, when you look at Dubai, basically, we are looking really at a regional Middle East Renaissance. Uh, our region needs always a success story. And the importance of Dubai that we live in a very critical era, basically, in the Middle East. So our region require a home-growing successful story and a model that's a home-growing model not a model that's being imposed from outside on us the importance of Dubai and the essence of Dubai is really is having this model having this model in a short span of time having this model which is being adopted being international but adopting the culture and the custom and respecting the culture of the region but also a model that's very innovative, basically. We are not the richest. Our GDP out of oil is only 3%, and out of tourism, 30%. And that happened only in the past 10 years. So our role is really to innovate. And I, when you look at new champion, I look at we have company as a new champion, we have city as a new champion, and we have country as a new champion. Being innovative and adopting the change is very important. We start as 10 years ago as a local player, our aim was, a lot of people ask me, guys, why are you doing whatever you are doing? There is any political pressure from our side to change? And my answer really, we are doing it for a better future for our kids, really. I look at my kids, do we want to create hope for them and prosperity, or would they have misery and they'll become radical, basically? So you have to have a mission if you want to change. And the mission is very simple is, we'd like to have a better future for our kids. We innovated our government. A lot of people look at Dubai and they say Dubai Inc. Because really we brought some of the best practice from the private sector and we put it in the government. And probably what we are one of the few government in the world where we show rating of all the government department in a yearly base. So you know who is the best government department and who is the worst, basically. And that's built tremendous pressure, basically, in all the government enterprise. Other than that, I think our, our role was really is re reinvent the businesses of our region. For the first time, yes, we start locally, we went regionally, then we went to the globe. And the issue was, how do we link the Middle East economy to the world economy? And we get criticized for that a lot of time, that we say we're not linked. And one of the first experiences that we tried to link ourselves to the world was through DP World, basically. And, and we found that there is a jungle out there, actually. When we went, basically, with DP World, basically, the resistance been tremendous in the United States. We didn't understand why. You know? we, we never lobbied before. We didn't look at, at lobbying. But we learned from that lesson, basically. It is, you know, I, I can say, they look at it from a security point of view. Other, they say it's a bit prejudiced because you are an Arab and you come from the Middle East. Middle East. It's a combination of all the above, basically, I think, in the end of the day. But adopting and changing, and that also didn't stop us. I mean, for all the new champions, you got to look at things. you got to do it. Maybe there is some resistance. you got to teach the other. But also the most important thing, you got to adopt yourself and reinvent yourself. That didn't stop us from investing in our state. You know, we have other investment. We went to other country basically, but also we built confidence in the Middle Eastern institution that they cannot only be a regional or local player, they have the globe basically as their platform and the world really is flat. And, and if you look at the past couple of months basically at how much, how many companies in the Middle East that went global, you know exactly what was our role. I think just we are a small model. The good, the good thing about it, this, this model is being replicated. You know, ten years ago, seven years ago, a lot of, a lot of people looked at, at us and they say, you know what, you guys wouldn't make it. There is a lot of hesitant. We are too fast. We are too ambitious. 
And today we are seeing the models being, and we are very happy about it. I mean, the better Middle East, the, 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 the more prosper Middle East, it's good for us, it's good for our region. The most important thing is good for our kids 20 years down the road. Thank you. I hear the word replicable, scalable, and growing too fast. I think uh, that's the challenge of uh, the developing countries. In the sense, at times you feel uh, you, you, are, you are no time, so you need to grow fast. And I think uh, how do you grow fast without stumbling, I think, is the challenge for nations and for uh, individual companies. Alex, would you like to share your story? Well, the story is quite remarkable. I mean, actually, it goes back 10 years where almost impossible thing happened. And the whole story is actually about impossible happening. It's like an American young kid comes and makes a joint venture with Soviet 60-year-old professor. One doesn't speak Russian, the other one doesn't speak English. Nevertheless, they made a deal, and the company now is worth $45 billion 10 years later and has 65 million subs. I think that what's happening in the emerging markets and story of Vimpelcom, now Russia became actually number four market in the world in terms of subscribers, as you're showing that a lot of things are shifting, are changing, and signal which emerging markets are sending, including us, uh, not that just we're a regional leader. We're saying to all champions, actually, beware. Things are changing, we're getting strengths, and a lot of paradigms will be changing in the world. Look, one of the big operators uh, came to us and said, why don't you guys take uh, this type of service from us or this technology from us? And then was amazed to discover that actually we're already on next generation. We're running the biggest real-time network in the world, which is kind of inconceivable with the legacy which that operator had in the past and uh, what they're doing in uh, their respective countries. I think that if you uh, talk about old champions and new champions and what sort of collaboration can be there, I believe it's more of a competition and we need to be prepared that actually emerging markets are changing a lot of preconceptions and one of those how you define the businesses, right? You have rising stars and you have cash cows. Guess what? Our business is fast raising cash cow. And uh, with that really powerful resource, new business models, which are totally, totally new and challenging the way business used to be done, we are ready to attack much bigger businesses and in other countries. And I think that a lot of stories uh, of the other people will confirm that. Thank you. Uh, again. Uh, amazing story, uh, growth in such a short period of time. Uh, we will draw you out as we go along as to uh, what that cost curve means, what the technology curve means, because I think there are lessons in, all of, uh, in that for all of us, because this is where I think the new champions really score. Now, Aditya, could we have uh, your amazing story? 15 years, 16 years, the world's largest uh, steel company disrupted the entire model of a steel company and uh, starting from a very modest beginning, hard work, story please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, the story has not been easy. It's been littered with obstacles and, and challenges, uh, ranging from currency devaluations to credit crisis to the more interesting in which instead of finding steel in our warehouses in Kazakhstan, we find red wine bottles uh, to become a catalyst in, in a political revolution in, in, in a country in, in, in the CIS. Uh, the story that I want to talk today about is uh, the ArcelorMittal merger because I think it culminates the strategy and the vision that the company started out 15 years ago. I, I won't focus on the business model because I think Alex has done a great job describing how the new champions have distinct competitive advantages, uh, they're scalable, they have a low cost basis and, and they can expand globally. Uh, the reason why we wanted to merge with Arcelor is because historically the steel industry never earned its cost of capital. It was always fragmented. On the supply side, we had mining companies. On the demand side, we had these automotive customers. We were unionized. We were squeezed in the middle. And for decades, uh, we never made money. Uh, seven years ago, a third of the U.S. steel industry filed for bankruptcy. Uh, here in Europe, we had Chorus, uh, which, was filing, which was close to bankruptcy. Uh, so cl clearly, the situation was dire. Uh, our strategy was to consolidate. Uh, we had been doing that through various acquisitions, but the key target for us was, was Arcelor, a proud uh, European company. 
So we were used to obstacles, but we were surprised when we made our bid. Uh, exactly two years uh, when everyone was in Davos, uh, the amount of resentment that we faced. Uh, there were four governments which uh, denounced the transaction. One head of state went to parliament and he made a speech for half an hour as to why they would do everything in their power uh, to block our bid. On a personal anecdote, I, I remember meeting uh, with the senior government minister uh, the next morning. He had called us over for breakfast. Uh, he told us to uh, get out of his country, uh, that a hostile bid uh, needs a hostile response. Uh, never mind the fact that that country had done, its state-owned companies had done hostile deals in the past. Uh, almost to drive home the point, uh, the coffee was cold, and no matter how much I reached, I could never find the croissant uh, or the toast. So we were clearly not welcome. Uh, this was protectionism uh, raising its, its ugly head, uh, uh, almost saying that globalization is not a two-way street, it's a one-way street. Uh, we found support in, in un unexpected corners. Uh, the EU was very supportive and very neutral. The Indian government actually uh, came up and, and supported us very strongly. Uh, they saw a threat uh, that if this deal does not go through, then the globalization of Indian companies would become difficult and the level playing field uh, that we all need uh, would not exist. Through communication, through explaining our strategy, uh, what the media called having a charm offensive uh, to all governments, we explained why this was good for European industry, why this was good for jobs, uh, why this was good for the steel industry. And eventually, after uh, six months of, of trying to create a level playing field, uh, we did the merger. Uh, clearly, the merger was successful. Uh, employees on both sides of the deal are, are genuinely happy. Uh, our stock has doubled in the meantime, but more importantly, the steel industry has re-rated itself. Uh, the steel industry is, is considered sexy today. It was never sexy. Uh, even when I joined uh, almost 12 years ago, uh, the multiples have changed and, and we look to a brighter and, and stronger future. Uh, so the path to becoming a global champion is, is never easy. Uh, it's, it's not been easy in our 15 years. Uh, we, we, we were bold, we were passionate in what we believed. Uh, we persevered, we were committed, and underpinning all of that was a sound business strategy. And I think we will see more of that as, as, as strong companies from the emerging markets uh, are passionate, uh, they want to persevere, and they want to change the world. Thank you, Aditya. What I heard was uh, be bold, persevere, and uh, try, try, try again. When uh, we ask you some more questions, we'll talk of the early days too. Because this was an acquisition you did when you were already there, it was a large champion, indeed a new champion but a large champion and you face this bottleneck, you won. But the early days would have been very interesting and uh, I'm sure everyone would love to hear uh, that. James, uh, this is a remarkable story, the whole Asia Pacific Rim. Uh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll try to come in from the Asia Pacific uh, yes. uh, perspective where our group have uh, grown over the last uh, few decades. I think companies should recognize that the rapid rise of China and India uh, is due to two major things happening. The first one is the overall trends in the Asia Pacific. Secondly, it's the, what's going on in, the, in those countries themselves. I think the first thing is that at the end of World War II, the center of economic activity in the Asia Pacific is in the United States of America. America went through uh, a period of uh, fast growth and which created higher living standards but also higher living costs and higher production costs. And as a result, uh, year after year, companies can no longer survive in the United States and have to shift out to Japan. In the 50s, you see the textile industries shifting. In the 60s, you have the steel, the shipbuilding. Then you've got the uh, uh, automotive industry. Then you've got electronics. So companies after companies could no longer survive in the United States. So they shifted to Japan. Japan went through the same process, shifted further to the so-called four tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. And I think uh, after that, it shifted further to the developing countries of Asia. You've got Thailand, you've got Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. Now, of course, with the opening up of China and India, they've joined into this whole trend. So it does not mean that the, those countries that are losing uh, the industries uh, get uh, behind. They just have to go into the higher value added uh, uh, economy. And I think that's what's happening. And I think uh, that, that's been a big part of what's happening. But the second thing is that 
I think what's happening, we need to recognize as companies, what's happening in India and in China is that their rapid rise is due to modernization that's happening in the economies. So which means that they will be, uh, the kind of growth that they're having will be sustainable over the next 10 or 20 years. So with this kind of context, uh, at least for our companies, we try to look at these uh, uh, trends and put ourselves as the bridge, as products and services are no longer produced where the market is, but where it is most effect effective and cost efficient to be produced. We want to be the bridge. We want to be the facilitator. By doing that, uh, we position ourselves to go outside of Indonesia, where our base is. And in the first stage, we went to Hong Kong and established our international headquarters. Hong Kong became the proxy for what's happening in East Asia, uh, this uh, North and East Asia. Uh, but lately, now we have shifted further into Singapore and also into Shanghai. Uh, and in the, fir in, uh, in the beginning, when we first started up in, in Hong Kong, the only way we could enter into China is through Hong Kong. And then there, there are five major companies from China that are authorized to go international. Bank of China, CITIC, China Merchants, China Travel, and China Resources. So we started uh, uh, having collaboration and partnership with them, and we have continued to maintain that kind, of, uh, that kind of partnership. So I think that's what we see, and we position our group to try and uh, uh, take advantage and, and benefit from those trends and what's happening in those countries. Thank you. That's a very interesting strategy. Uh, I heard you say be, be a bridge uh, to these markets, and you also traced uh, what happens in a competitive context. A country gets competitive, uh, then you lose that competitiveness to somebody else, you get to be high cost probably, and then it moves on there, and so on. The cycle moves on. And uh, I also heard you say that maybe in China and India something different is happening, because probably large populations are transforming, and uh, probably this will happen over a long period of time. And we'll revisit that. Now could I ask uh, Professor Cantor from what we have heard so far, what advice, ma'am? We will seek your advice again as we go along. <laughs> Thank you. And first of all, I ought to say that your company is also a wonderful example. You now operate as a bank in 18 countries yes, right. out of India, so maybe you'll also share some of your story. Yeah. Um, well, I teach at Harvard Business School, which is trying as hard as possible to be a global institution. We like to think we are. And um, in recent years, as I spend much of my time on airplanes around the world, I have worked with companies, not only global companies emanating out of the U.S. and Europe, but also companies coming from just about every country represented here. And if not this industry, similar industries. So Semex out of Mexico, that over a similar period of time as OxelorMittal has grown to become a global giant in the cement industry, construction industry, um, Shinhan Financial Group in Korea, Banco Real in Brazil, um, et cetera, MTN in South Africa, which now operates in 22 countries in Africa and the Middle East, including Dubai and Iran, by the way, where U.S. companies would be at the moment highly reluctant to invest. I have great respect for all of you sitting here and the accomplishments of your companies, and I have great respect for the other companies I have known, because they are also very different from the enterprises that used to dominate those countries, which often were family conglomerates without a strategy, without professional management, and operating in protected markets. These enterprises are all very different, especially as we hear that you have state-of-the-art technology in telecom, cell phones in Russia, for example, that's ahead. I couldn't use my Verizon wireless um, device here in Davos because our largest telecom provider is not on world standards from the U.S. And so I begin to feel my country is increasingly the backwater and we have to catch up. Um, but with that having said, I want to talk about some of the things we have to rethink based on what all of you have said. So that was a question for this session, what do we rethink? Well, one of, we rethink a few things. First of all, we rethink those cultural biases about where great companies come from, who's setting the standards, who has the highest standards, um, where sophisticated management exists. We ought to be learning lessons from each of these companies about entrepreneurial growth. Um, we have to rethink where the market opportunities are because, in fact, one of the ways established players 
gain benefits even from this increased competition besides being forced to be more competitive, which is they always see it as a mixed blessing at the time but is good later, is also that each one of these companies is opening markets by helping develop countries so that the markets are growing. And so for some of the global technology companies with which I work, many of which are still officially headquartered in the United States, even though a high proportion of their employment increasingly is in India and the BRIC countries, um, for those companies, each one of these things opens a market for their products and services. So this is a tremendous positive force in the world. So we have to rethink where the markets are. We have to rethink where the talent is. Um, and I'm going to get to that as an issue for all of you in your countries as well. Um, we have to rethink um, what happens not only to the established players from the developed world, but also to those that had been your competition within your countries, because they're just as threatened by your success as global companies. Because many of you and your companies are the leading edge, but you're not yet the type of company that dominates your, econ your own economy. That's still coming behind you. So I am old enough to remember when in the United States we had the huge scare, which James Riotti partly hinted at, the Japanese are coming. The Japanese are coming, they, have, they are strange, they're buying us, they're out competing our companies in the United States, whatever are we going to do? Um, well, Sony, which was one of the companies that came in and bought a lot of assets in the United States, first of all, didn't do particularly well with those assets because just because they had the money to buy it didn't know, knew, mean that they knew how to run it. They bought real estate that actually didn't have the value they paid for it because sometimes you generate a lot of cash out of your operations and don't always, I mean, other companies like Sony didn't make the best possible deals. And now Sony is being run by, yes, he's not an American by origin, but Sir Howard Stringer who was basically running U.S. companies. So there are cycles. And what happened and, and what do we learn from that is that companies can succeed as excellent companies, but in the long run also need the right infrastructure behind them in their, company, in their countries, the right reforms. I mean, with the enormous growth, for example, of companies in your region, you are in a war for talent, too. And unless the educational systems of your countries produce enough talent, now India happens to produce a very large number of scientists and engineers, uh, but that isn't true everywhere. And so unless the supporting conditions are there, will this be sustainable? Well, sure, because I think you're all excellent leaders in excellent companies, but in fact there are fumbles and stumbles everywhere. What also um, developed, company, developed country companies have to learn from you is they have to rethink their cost structures and their assumptions about innovation and where it comes from. But what, because you do have advantages of coming from places where you had to operate at lower costs to begin with, you have labor that might be at a lower cost, so you have some cost advantages. You also um, have some fresh start advantages, so you can begin with the best and latest technologies. You don't have legacy systems dragging you down. But once the companies against which you compete which have been in business a long time, suddenly realize, if they do realize, U.S. Steel never quite got it. Um, some of our telecom companies in the U.S. are running behind. So I would, some of our media companies didn't really acknowledge the Spanish-speaking market. So all of those things give you an, an advantage for a while, but once the established players catch up, you compete on the same basis that they do. I mean, they will have to reduce their costs. They will have to find sources of innovation. Um, and once they do, they will become either your partners or your competitors. The advantages come, actually, when partnerships begin. When suppliers, your suppliers, your, distrib your distributors, your vendors learn from you as well as try to impose what they know on you. So when we rethink the cultural assumptions, though, then I think um, American and European companies might learn how to compete from you, um, 
but they will then become your partner to help your business grow and also help their business grow in your region. Thank you, uh, Professor. Five or six points uh, which I jotted down, uh, Professor, which I'm going to ask in the next round uh, the panel to uh, comment on. I think the first one was culture, because I think we miss it most of the time, culture, and what is uh, the cultural aspect of uh, going out, uh, being a new champion, cost competitiveness and its sustain <coughs> sustainability. Innovation, do you continue to innovate? Uh, how do you partner and uh, the hunt for talent? And since you asked me to uh, speak, uh, I, will, I, will, uh, I will speak for one minute, uh, in our story in, in a minute. Uh, we are a bank. Uh, five years back or six years back, we had uh, less than half a million customers. We have 30 million customers today. Um, five years back, 95% of the transactions were done in a branch. Today, 25% uh, of the transactions are done uh, on the internet or on the cell phone. 22 out of the 25 is on the actual internet, 3% of the cell phone. Uh, and the branch is less than 15% of transactions. So that's the sort of disruption that was possible in the Indian context. Leveraging technology, indeed, the newer technologies, we did not have legacies, but we were bold enough to embrace uh, new technologies as they came. And as a result, today we probably run technology at more or less one-tenth the cost of any global bank uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, we have a fight for talent because that, I think, is a major, a major problem. But we have, you know, <coughs> we have faced this fight in a very interesting way. Uh, if you are going to have attrition, if you are going to have wage increases, 10-15% attrition, 10-15% wage increase, maybe you need to go out and uh, create talent. So what we did was we codified our knowledge, put it online, train the trainers, and uh, have given it out to either training institutes or universities, uh, wherever and whichever part of India, to include as part of curriculum in the basic degree. And we are doing the same thing uh, with, uh, I would say, management talent, not indeed to the level of uh, the large management institutions, but the talent that we require, partner with universities, work out curriculum which is common to, uh, to the financial services business and proceed. As a group, we recruit something like 30 to 35,000 direct recruits a year. And if we include insurance agents, that's another 200,000 people that we recruit. And all of them earlier on had to be retrained because they were not fit for the job. And then you face this 15% to 20% attrition. So you increase the pool. That has been the strategy that we adopted. I think it is these uh, competitive uh, measures which allow you to be bold enough to go out and say that we believe we can compete. And of course, in our case, uh, what we have done is we have tried to work with uh, the large Indian mass, which is outside India, the Indian companies which are going global, and that provides you uh, the momentum to go into those 18 countries that you uh, mentioned, ma'am. But our bigger challenge is not going out. I think our biggest challenge will be when we try to, try to serve the banking needs of 600 million people. I call it bank the unbanked. 600 million people living in 600,000 villages, Five years back, I could not have conceived how we could have solved this equation. But today, there's a, there's a solution. Using technology, the cost that Alex talks of, dropping costs, I think it's possible. That's our story. I won't take too much time. Uh, if I may come back to talent, cost competitiveness, culture, uh, sustainability, partnership. Uh, would you like to uh, start off? Let me start at the other end and come this side this sure. time. Aditya. Uh, th thank you. First of all, it's very impressive to hear what ICICI has done. We should not be too surprised if in five to ten years they buy a city or a UBS or one of these big global banks and, and, and really globalize their business because this is what we are seeing. Uh, I will take culture uh, uh, as, as uh, something that uh, is, is close to my heart. Uh, when we launched the bid uh, for Arcelor, we were told that there would be no cultural integrity and, and culture, I think, is, is one of the arguments that are used to prevent uh, the creation of a global company. And, and I think uh, there's no easy answer on culture, uh, but fundamentally, uh, I think there are three ingredients uh, to counter that. Uh, the most important is that you need to have uh, a very diverse workforce to begin with. Uh, so you need to have an open culture uh, to begin with. Uh, second, you need to be flexible. Uh, I don't think if you're an emerging champion or a new global champion, you can say that, look, since I did something five years ago or 10 years ago, this is how we're going to do it. You need to adapt and move uh, uh, forward. And, and the third, uh, third is to really listen and, and see what's going on. 
because often you don't uh, just see small things. Uh, I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, in, in our company, we have had a strong policy that you can't have alcohol over lunch, which sounds very reasonable. Uh, but every time we went to uh, our, our French counterparts, we saw they would have wine and, and, and white wine, red wine over lunch. So now when you come to our headquarters, uh, you're given a wine menu and you can choose red wine or white wine. Uh, it's one way of, of making uh, the French comfortable. And there are small, small things that you have to continuously do to adapt. And, and I think today we have an integrated company, uh, truly an integrated company. If you type, uh, ask the average ArcelorMittal employee, they feel at home, uh, they feel comfortable. And only if they feel at home and, to the, and if they are comfortable can they deliver the best. And I think one of the big challenges is how do you integrate a global culture and, and make sure people can thrive in it. And, and really it's, it's don't be rigid, be adaptive, listen and see, uh, and, and try and be more embracing than trying to impose your own values on other people. Thank you, Aditya. Emilio, any one of if any one or more of uh, the points that we have had? No, I believe that the, the question also of culture, we had a, when, when we started uh, selling our, our programming back in, we started selling in the States in 1961, and, uh, and, and my father thought that he needed to expand the company outside of Mexico, and my grandfather, who was still alive, decided that he was going to buy a channel there was Channel 61 in San Antonio, and back then nobody could really watch UHF channels. So, so my father thought that my grandfather was too old to, to expand into, into a country that supposedly was English speaking. But taking that story to 1991, when we bought a company called Univision, we did a business plan thinking that 20 or 25 percent of the bilingual people we're going to come back to watch Spanish-speaking television against our counterparts in English. And after five years of that business plan, uh, out of the two and a half or a third year, the business plan was already done and everybody was very happy. But we obviously made a very big mistake in doing that business plan. And the mistake was that not 25% of the people who were bilingual came back to watch Spanish-speaking television, but it was close to 75 to 80%. And what I believe there is, it's a question of culture, but also of quality. And turning also to, to Vital's early point of, of, of getting into these developed countries or competitive countries and getting people who don't really want you to, to compete in, in, in their yard, it's, it's impressive what we see today when you see newscasts in Los Angeles that the first uh, ratings in newscasts are, are are the Spanish-speaking newscasts now. And, or suddenly, we're criticized about the quality of our stories because we do telenovelas, like I said, close to soap operas, and everybody says that, that those love stories doesn't work. And then suddenly, there's this big production that everybody remembers 10 years ago called Titanic. And, and everybody that went to Titanic, we already knew that the ship was going to sink, so it was not about the ship. And you see the, 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 the characters, and it's the characters that we use. You have you know, the, the very rich bad guy and the really nice girl who fell in love with the poor guy, but the aunt who lost all, the, all her money wanted to marry her to the, to, the, to the bad guy. The only different thing is that we never killed the good guy. No, I believe that that was an error that James Cameron did, but I mean, that's another story. So, so I believe that that, what, that that culture also and, and is very important for our customers, no, not just to create a, a, a global company and create the, the stability for everybody in different countries. But I believe that also culture is very important for our, for our customers. And I think that uh, competitiveness is, is, is very, not easy to achieve, but I, when, when you come from, from our part of the world, we have a very cost-effective structure, no? because we have learned the hard way because of devaluations, because of crises that you need that. We operate uh, television with close to 50% uh, EBITDA margin, and that makes us the best uh, television operation in the world, because the best radio operation in the world operates with around 35 to 37%, and obviously radio is cheaper to operate than television. So. So the cost structure that we have, I believe, has more competitiveness against our, our competitors outside. You know? So that, that helps a lot. And I believe also it's a common denominator that these companies that we're talking about have. Thank you. Uh, we heard Aditya 
say in a cultural context don't be rigid I think even if it comes to uh, policies which have been ingrained you might have to revisit them I think Emilio talked about quality culture and cost competitiveness he talked of uh, the 50 percent EBITDA and I think from one 50 percent EBITDA company we go to a, another I think 50 percent EBITDA company Lex? Uh, that's true uh, one of the lowest <laughs> prices actually and one of the highest margins clearly that speaks for uh, the business model and that it can be replicated in different markets but I still allow myself to come back to culture because I believe it's very very important but I would before that uh, make one remark that actually the purpose of the discussion as I understood it today is not just what's good and interesting happening in those interesting countries which we represent I think the issue is much more fundamental who wins in the future and would it be new markets and new economies because there is a lot of talk that actually uh, in 10 20 years uh, BRICS will represent a large chunk of the economy and certainly will be three countries out of uh, four would be in top six economies so that's one side uh, is it new versus old or it's more efficient versus less efficient and therefore where is more efficiency is it in the new economies or in the old economies I think that actually the answer is of course is not so binary I think it's a combination of uh, different qualities of the companies which makes an efficient operator I said this coming back to culture uh, the topic of the day in Davos, I think, is sovereign wealth funds, right? I mean, it's like everybody talks about it and every, everybody suspects some conspiracy uh, behind that. And that's squarely being projected on all attempts of the companies like uh, Mittal uh, to go and acquire something and meets a lot of resistance. And I think that that puts additional burden on us. Uh, we, coming from the emerging markets, have to prove uh, that actually uh, we are operating on a high ethical standards with high transparency and so on. We manage not just to operate at 5 cents and 50 percent EBITDA margin. Uh, we manage to do it actually being listed on New York Stock Exchange for the last 10 years, being first Russian company who came to Stock Exchange and carrying all the niceties of uh, Sorbins Oxley and uh, sort of nevertheless generating that margin, right? And I think that that track record needs to be created but also it should be more trust coming from the other side that actually when we're coming it it is good companies which do uh, adhere to high ethics and high standards second if you think about the culture it's not only specific culture of the country or of the market of course it's given that it has to be taken but also it's a corporate culture and uh, yesterday German Graf was talking about what he saw in Vietnam when he came there and he saw young people it was just sort of hunger in their eyes uh, in good sense right hunger uh, hunger for business hunger for development and I think that our companies bring exactly this because many of the big companies fat and complacent and we are bringing different level of energy different actually appetite for risk and for growth and therefore have completely different attitude to what's right and what's wrong in this business and I think that uh, will determine quite a bit who will win and who will lose uh, going forward in terms of costs uh, and in terms of talent actually that's where I would pick up that's probably for us at least the biggest shortage and I don't see how fundamentally a country like Russia can bridge that gap which been uh, generated over decades uh, when uh, so basically notion of profit uh, that was only Karl Marx knew what it is and the rest of the population didn't and uh, so we have to educate ourselves we have to develop managerial skills uh, which are not there and it will take time and that's where we can borrow actually from uh, all champions and collaboration in talent development between new economies and old economies new world and old world uh, could be very very productive same goes into innovation our innovation predominantly is in business models how to do business in a new surprising way and you just gave a great example how the banking is done totally different because you're addressing uh, segments of the population which been unthinkable to address in a standard banking uh, approach so it's innovation in the business model however fundamental innovations in the technology they're all coming from the great established houses in our case it's Ericsson Nokia and so on and it will continue so cooperation and understanding where you uh, 
transform. I love this expression. Uh, so research, it's when you transform money into knowledge and development when you transform knowledge into money. So we're about development, but we still need research. And uh, that collaboration actually is uh, very important and uh, probably will be uh, very effective going forward. Thank you. I think we will uh, come to that issue uh, in terms of uh, who wins in the future in a moment. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll step a bit aside. I think uh, we talked about uh, cost, uh, talent, uh, culture, uh, and I think one of our challenges when, when you look at things is really the geopolitical arena within our area. We, we, we live in an area where other than being a CEO of a, of a company, you got to be every morning a politician and understand exactly what's going to happen within this region, basically. So very important for us as a company, basically, as Dubai Holding, is to understand the geopolitical issue, basically, that faces us every morning within our region, basically. Sometimes it's unpredictable, but at the end of the day, you have to have all the scenario, basically, to understand what you want to do if something happened uh, there. Another element I would like to add here, talent, basically. And I think that there is a war in talent, basically. And, and that's across the board, wherever you are. I, I don't think so. That, I, I never thought that the problem would be in India with, with the talent pool, but see, it's almost everywhere. And we have a similar thing, basically, within our entity. I don't know, the chain is sometimes high. There is a competition in good people. Uh, salaries go up uh, quickly. And, and we try to be very innovative within, within our company, basically. Bear in mind, we live in a country where uh, when I was growing up, we had only one high school when, it, when we got our independent from England. Uh, the whole country, basically, got only 45 university graduates in the 70s. Five of them were female only. That's the whole country. And our innovative really solution came basically is, yes, we had that issue in the 70s, Today, we had one of the highest enrollment of female from high school to university. It's 92% from uh, girls within our country who finish high school, they enroll in university. So we found out there is a tremendous talent, talent pool called, you know, female talent within our country. And, and we are a Muslim, we are an Arab country, and, you know, there is this stereotype, there is a lot of restriction, basically, in women. We found out that by enabling them that actually they became a very good resources for us. Usually they stay longer, I mean in a company. Uh, I don't know why, they have a high loyalty basically for, for a company and very un innovative basically. And really the way we looked at it, we set up a model basically for the region. Uh, there is a belief they became very, very, very good in what they are doing. Uh, but meanwhile, we looked at the culture, basically, how also we can adopt their need, you know. Usually they, they get married, they have kids, and, and they leave. So we're starting adopting, basically, where we start building within our company, a nursery. They can leave early. So we adopt the company based on the society and the cultural need, basically. And we became successful. Successful socially, we, are, we enable female uh, to work and to join the workforce. And we found them really, they outperform really male within, within our companies. Very interesting uh, thoughts. Uh, I think all who have spoken so far have talked about uh, the war on talent, some very interesting solutions to this, empowering women, getting them into uh, the mainstream as it were, and not only getting them there, but uh, keeping them there, and making sure that you know, in a way the societal needs are met to achieve this. James. I agree uh, with uh, Mr. Gergawi, I think. Uh, as our companies have grown bigger and bigger, and as we have operations in multiple countries, the problems that we face are not scientific financial issues, but actually are those cultural issues, particularly the political, social political issues. And we know that a lot of the growth areas today, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in China, India, and so on, the rule of law and the, ru and, and the law itself often is not as important as what goes on behind it. So I think uh, those become the challenges that we face. We also know that uh, lately with so much globalization, there's been a growing trend of protectionism all over the place. 
So as we go into different countries, uh, those are the issues. And I think to be sensitive about cultural issues is for us at least being right. Uh, because if we try to be flexible and so on, we, we, we run the risk of becoming compromising. Uh, and over in the long term, I think uh, uh, for us it's better to be right. And which means that it depends on your set of values, uh, your set of beliefs. Uh, I think the second thing that I want to say is, is the sustainability. And I think as I said earlier on, uh, having, uh, having those trends that's, hap uh, that's happening, each one of our companies must just go on the higher value added uh, chain to transform uh, ourselves. And I think uh, the companies that are represented here, I'm not as sure as the steel industry, all have gross margins of above 50%. When we have gross margins of above 50%, I think the talent is not necessarily the, 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 the most important. I think those two or three strategic decisions in a year that can make or break uh, our competitiveness uh, uh, along the way. But I think we must modernize. Uh, we must modernize. Uh, we must uh, uh, change our mindset the way that we do our businesses. Uh, and, 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 of course, follow the markets, what the trends are. Thank you, uh, James. Uh, I have to thank uh, Professor Cantor. She was so she who brought out the issue of culture. And we now have had uh, the whole thing blossom out. I'm going to come back to you uh, after sharing one more, maybe a bit of, uh, from our side, um, in terms of empowerment, because... May I just uh, comment about culture for one yeah, second please. and not go through my list of the success factors, which is... There's an additional, we were talking about culture inside the company, but culture across, the cross-cultural relationship as you move outside your country. And that's always a challenge. That's a challenge for the established players. But if you come with the additional questions in the mind of countries that have pride in their own country, then you have to work even harder to show that you operate to high standards. That's one of the messages. And that says that many of the emerging champions may be an important force for raising standards all over the world, because you have to meet higher standards to overcome the cultural biases. Indeed. Uh, we will uh, want to hear uh, you know, those uh, five or six drivers for uh, emerging champions. And uh, you know, will we succeed? The, the new uh, champions, so called. In courts, yes, that we are in courts, we need to see. But I want to just maybe push this uh, one more point so that you can add that to what uh, you are going to deliberate on, ma'am. That is women and uh, empowering women and uh, getting them into the mainstream, particularly for developing countries. This could be a, a game changer. And I think uh, the point, point that was made by Mr. Gargavi, bringing them into the mainstream has become a critical aspect of the success that. Uh, they've had in the region. And in our own case, it's very interesting that we run a gender-neutral organization. We truly mean it in the sense we don't really worry about any job being handled by a male or a female. Uh, it's a meritocracy. As a result, we have at uh, the board level in terms of executive positions, equal number of men and women. Nobody decided it should be equal. You go down into a group companies, we find the same distribution. Go down below, it's the same distribution. So people ask me, how does this happen? I says that's nature, and if that's nature, and we follow a meritocracy, you have to have that order. So I think uh, there is tremendous merit in uh, you know, recognizing this, being conscious of this, and trying to run a meritocracy, or where you need to give a helping hand, give that helping hand, so that then you have uh, this empowerment happen. Ma'am, we'd love to hear you. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I thought you were going to have me wait till later. So. Some of the success factors that all of you have talked about and that seem to be essential both for the established players as well as for the emergent champions, and you have an advantage as long as the established players haven't yet made these changes. Um, I have an article in this month's issue, the current issue of Harvard Business Review called Transforming Giants, which has two meanings, both how large enterprises transform themselves and how they become forces for transforming the world around them. So that's added to the equation when we begin to talk about companies from emerging markets where you have to be a transforming force in your country, as w in your countries, as well as 
internally transform. So a few success factors. One is that we, we often talk about thinking globally, meaning you have to want to be international from the beginning, but I think it has a different meaning. It means to get rid of the bias that comes from wherever your headquarters or your home base is as a company, to get rid of those biases quickly. And that becomes a center, but it doesn't become the driver of all assumptions, that unless people are at headquarters, they don't have power to make decisions, that the culture emanates from headquarters. So here we have the example of VasselorMittal becoming Frenchified um, by bringing the culture from one of the regions in which they operate back into the center. And that's so it's signaling inclusion. So diversity is inevitable. We talk about a diverse workforce, a number of you have said, so women become an, an extra in the pool, but it's that international diversity and ethnic diversity within countries. Remember that many of the countries in the developing world have incredible ethnic, racial, um, diversity within them, partly because of a result of migrations and partly as a result of traditional cultures that have coexisted in countries that have moved together. So diversity is inevitable and international diversity is what will help you grow. So what you have to do then, you've got the diversity, is signal inclusion and that everyone is included at the center of the company. There isn't some groups that are peripheral and therefore they undermine success because they're resentful. The second thing is high standards, again, coming back to what I said earlier about needing to signal that. Um, many of the companies that I work with from the emerging markets have also listed on the New York Stock Exchange with considerable effort, um, and they made the commitment because they said, we looked around to say what's the way to find the highest standard in the world, and in terms of financial transparency, that was a signal. But for other things, it might come from other countries. But they look for the highest standard in the world. James Riotti said we've got to hold to our standards and not be too flexible about adapting to local customs if they might have an unethical element to them. And again, I see that in the best companies. So Semex had to wait much longer to get a contract in Egypt because they had an absolute standard coming from Mexico that they would not engage in bribery, corruption, um, backhanded deals, etc. But of course, in France, when they bought a European company, they didn't believe that the Mexicans are coming meant high standards. So again, they had to work harder to signal that. And so these are forces. These companies do want world standards and to meet them. Um, because they need them as a tool to integrate the enterprise and also to be able to acquire and operate in other countries. Um, a third thing that's very important is explicit values to knit it all together. And it's interesting that corporate social responsibility is high on everybody's agenda. Coming out of the BRIC countries, particularly Brazil and India, I have to say, there is a tremendous sense of the need to take care of our people and develop the country, a tremendous sense of responsibility that comes from a desire to see the whole country be strengthened, not just the business do well. And so uh, the emerging champions also understand the need for a core set of values that have to do with improving the world and not just making money. We've heard about all the money you've made, and that's phenomenal, um, but I, I would imagine that you know that you can't continue to sustain that without the world around you being improved. But there's also a strong sense of being able to attract and motivate talent because the young people also want to feel that they're making a contribution to the world. And I hear this everywhere, Latin America as well as Asia as well as um, Africa. Um, the, another ingredient is your openness to the best and the latest. So it's not simply that you're innovating in your business models, which is tremendous, but that you're open to ideas because you don't have a lot of entrenched interests saying we can't do that because we've never done it that way before because of the fresh start. And so you're able to incorporate new ideas faster and then that becomes a tradition that will help sustain continuing innovation. And that is something that some of the established players really need to learn as they face much more competition. 
And so flexible people with a hunger, with high aspirations, and with a great deal of confidence. I mean, these are all very confident companies, and that's important because you lose for two reasons. You lose by being arrogant, bloated, fat, overconfident, which has happened to many companies in the developed world, but you also lose by having a population of people that doesn't set high aspirations, that's underconfident, that believes that people like us couldn't possibly do it, that if we come from our country, we must be lesser than those Western civilizations that had already developed. And that's also a trap that had kept many um, countries that were supposed to be emerging markets in a downward spiral. And so you need just the right degree of confidence to say our people can do it. We have the talent, set high aspirations, but yet we also must be hungry and open to change all the time because we could lose to the competition, even though right now we're riding high. Thank you, ma'am. I think what I hear you say is uh, the emerging champions here, if you have to really succeed, uh, get your mindset right, get rid of those biases, think globally, get your culture right, uh, accept diversity, uh, be open to new ideas, be inclusive, set high standards. By that you would mean be competitive in everything that you do. And uh, finally, uh, have a heart for your country. I think that is one distinguishing feature that each of these champions have as compared to maybe established companies which have been doing business for uh, many, many years. And uh, I would take it from this that uh, if these are right, then uh, an emerging champion has a far better chance of success. You know, nobody can, uh, dict I think, uh, forecast success and say you would succeed. Uh, I think we still could discuss uh, one more uh, item, which is are there barriers and are these barriers dropping? But before we do that, I would like to open this up to uh, our audience and then maybe come back if we have time to this question. Please. Uh, I think uh, for uh, regional champions or, or the new champions to flourish, uh, I would like to touch on the barriers because those champions needs to, uh, need to create critical mass in order to create sustainability and growth. Uh, we see during the last two days a lot of talk about protectionism and about attacks on the SWF, which in my opinion is uh, blown out of proportion. But let us ask each other, how about protectionism? I heard from the panel that it is one way, which I think it is. Uh, some regional champions face protectionism from the regional markets, not only from the international markets. There is a war on talent, and I think uh, on culture, it is not only a culture of, for markets and, and what have you, but I think more uh, successful companies are able to uh, make the, the, the workforce partners, not by incentive schemes, but by, by, being, by the feel of being partners. Uh, other issue I would like also to raise uh, for you, Ms. Cantor, I think you referred to something regarding Egypt, regarding uh, Semex. Uh, I don't understand in what context have you been uh, referring to, but uh, from my knowledge, uh, I think that Semex did a tender offer in Egypt and acquired the cement player, and they are a major player in the yes. market. Yes, they are. Uh, and I don't, I don't understand what, what, what was hindering them, because at the end of the day it was a transparent market. Oh, no, no. They, Thank they, you. Sorry, if I can just comment and clarify that, and then let other people respond to the other questions. They did acquire a company. In fact, they were considered one of the models of the privatization of a state enterprise. But there was um, a, a negotiation that they were engaged in later. It had nothing to do with the government. It had to do with local officials. And they were told that the usual practice was such, and but because of their, their code of conduct globally, they bypassed the local custom and um, wait, had to wait much, much longer for approval for what they wanted to do, ultimately got approval because, in fact, it was the right thing to do. Um, but they were, in that sense and in many other senses, they were bringing a different standard um, that said there's another way to do business. Thank you. Just a question for Mr. Grigawi or Mr. Riyadi, and that is uh, the strategy to take your investments and to sprinkle the money within the region where it's most needed. 
I see that Dubai Holding, and we've seen this in Qatar, for example, uh, doing real estate projects in Algeria and Syria and the less fortunate uh, countries so far. Is it a dual strategy for a new emerging champion to take your money and say, okay, this has to make a return on assets, but this is a neighborhood that needs help? And is it a two-pronged strategy? And it, does the CSR as aspect and the security aspect come into it? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, uh, you touch a very good base. And Dubai Holding, whatever we try to do, I mean, you talk about the social uh, corporate responsibility. And one of the things, for example, we did, you know, uh, I, I chair a foundation, $10 billion foundation. I'm part of this from Dubai Holding, basically. And this is our role, basically, within our region. Our role is very, very, very simple. Yes, it is a business, but we have a business with, with a cause. At the end of the day, I have to wake up every morning believing in something. Not not to make money, but I believe that our role is to change our region. Our region deserves to be like the rest of the world. So there is a role that we have to play in our business and whatever we do. You touch an example that our investment in North Africa. I mean, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and other places. Uh, there is close to $20 billion investment within that region that, that, that we have. Uh, by doing so, we are tackling a couple of issues, basically. It's a good business, yes, but also if you look at the illegal immigrant from North Africa to Spain, to France, to Italy, and how many lives is being lost every year, basically, in this migration. If we can create hundreds of thousands of jobs, basically, within that, within that, that region, if we can create a sustainable model for the region, I mean, we went to Tunis, and what we are doing there, we are trying to create a business capital, basically, within, within the country, basically. So there is this, this edge, personally, really. I, I mean, for me, I need a cause in life. And the cause is really is our region. Uh, it is not easy. Sometimes there is, we have barrier. Sometimes it's not fair, but again, I think this is our war. Our war is really to fight poverty, to educate people. Education is important, but the most important thing is also for the Middle East is to have a wider middle class, a wider entrepreneurship, and that's what something that we are doing basically. We're working with a couple of universities within our region is to create an entrepreneurship center in every university will give them the seat money, basically. Our aim is we'd like people to start business so they can hire in the future. 100 people, 1,000, 2,000 people. So whatever we do, really, there is this balance, really. It's not, it's not a pure business. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. And that, at the end of the day, what matters, basically, it is to save our region. And we are one of the elements, and I think there is so many elements, there is so many co company within, within our region. And what we've seen, I'll say, well, you know, everybody talking about slowdown, everybody talking about recession. And one of the places that we, I'll say it wouldn't be really affected is the Middle East, and most probably India and, and Russia and Africa, with the recession basically because just the economy is opening up in this region. We have different type of government in the past 50 years for, I mean, you call them socialism, you call them communism, sometimes you don't know exactly what they're doing. But for the first time, all of them are shifting toward one, an, an open uh, market economy, basically. Some of them are going faster, others slower, but it's a herd mentality. Everybody's migrating toward that. By doing that, I think so, that's our role as, as Dubai, is we'll create 10 of thousands of businessmen and women within our region. We need within our region for the next only 10 years, 80 million jobs. And no other economy in history have given in 10 years 80 million, 80 million jobs. So there is a challenge. We don't look at, at our business as pure business. We look at our business as a model of change. We are an advocate of change. That's who we are really in that of, uh, that of the day. You want to just supplement? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, for myself, uh, my group grew uh, on the basis that we did business just purely to make money. But I think over the last 10 years, the last 15 years, 
uh, I think we've been reflecting of in, in terms of what is the real basis of, of our businesses. And I really believe that uh, right now, yes, you must run it as a business, otherwise it's not sustainable. You must run every one of our businesses as an industry. But I think what must come first is the vision. And I think that will be the barrier if we do not have a clear vision. I find that it is really the vision that our people stick with us. It is really having a vision that they buy, that they believe in, that brings our partners to continue to support us, uh, especially when, when we have uh, challenges in front of us. So uh, for, for, for our family group, it is growing in stewardship. We believe that everything we have is an opportunity from God that we must be accountable, and we want to do that in the best that we can. But also impacting lives. How do we tra transform that to impact lives? Uh, so I agree with the, the, with the first uh, comment from the gentleman about you know, uh, this, uh, to make the workforce as the partners. How do we do that? It's not just partners in, finan uh, in, in financial terms, but actually in the same vision, that they have the same vision as us. So, I, so the whole thing about uh, CSR uh, is very, very important. I, and, and I must say that having attended Davos for a number of years, this has helped me shape about what CSR is all, uh, it's all about. Thank you, James. Want to add? Just, just a brief comment. Many markets actually in the emerging uh, domain went through a lot of upheavals. And therefore, current generation, particularly young generation, observed dramatic shift in values, or actually like in case of Russia, disintegration of Soviet Union and so on, left a lot of void. And therefore, there is on one hand side, there is a lot of cynicism because nobody believed in what's been said or it was dual standards all the time. And on the other hand, there is a great desire of acquiring proper values and actually adhering to those values and going forward. And I think that the role of companies like ours uh, would be partially playing that and filling that void and providing those values that actually you do live, not only making money, of course, but not only for that. You do greater for society, and by doing that, we hope to attract greater talent to our company. So it's absolutely essential. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come back very quickly to barriers to entry in CSR, because I think they're actually very linked. Uh, when we, when we, every time we expand in a new country, people are very concerned about what is ArcelorMittal, who is ArcelorMittal. And we have a very simple two-pronged strategy. Number one, you need to communicate, uh, not only with the media, which uh, uh, is natural, but with politicians, uh, got, uh, stakeholders, more importantly, unions and management, and explain your strategy. And every time we communicate, everyone says the same story. We're a great company. We can do this. Our communication is focused on CSR. And uh, our communication is, look what we did in the previous country we entered. Send a delegation, go visit, send your ministers, and see that we've completely transformed the community and the society through our investment. And that, I think, is the most powerful. And CSR can also be an enabler. For example, we record a company in Romania in which the employees were completely distraught about the future. They did not believe they had a future, even though we, we promised investments. So I actually met, uh, met with the bishop and asked him, what do we do to, uh, to improve the morale of this uh, company? And he recommended we should build a church at the entrance of our company uh, and get all the workers involved, uh, spend a couple million dollars, and jointly build a church which will demonstrate the rebuilding of the steel plant. So I think to counter barriers to entry, you need to have a CSR policy which is very strong, which you can show to others is, is defining and a competitive advantage to really succeed to become a global champion. Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Gilberto Marin. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all these young people that has a very excellent success. And especially, um, I just want to point it out, the social responsibility, because it's very nice to have 50% Evita, but also doing very uh, important things for the society. Especially, I am very proud, and I would like you, if Mr. Ascara can comment something about Fundación Televisa and what they did for the Teleton. I'm telling you, yeah, because in Mexico we know what many of the audience maybe don't know, those things that uh, some companies are doing too. He's actually my client, so. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I believe that, uh, like I was saying, is we, we didn't, or, or I didn't know anybody in this, in this panel on, until today, 
and I think there's a lot of common denominators, and one of those is, is corporate social responsibility. I believe that also the advantage that we have in, in, in a media company is that you, you can get your message across to millions of people very fast. But not only uh, using uh, the programming that we do in Mexico, because we sell, depending on the program, but between 30 to 40 countries that program. So whatever message that we put into that program, it can be a message of, of, of value, it can be a message of uh, uh, cancer, it can be a lot of messages that we, that we go through. Those messages travel also to 35 to 45 countries. I believe that in, in, in our parts of the world, or the parts that are sitting here of the world, uh, politicians alone cannot make it. Uh, so I believe that there's a responsibility on the, on the big uh, companies, on the big enterprises, to try not only to, to make money, but to use the money and the mediums that we have uh, at, at, at our hands to, to try to build a better country. And obviously, that's going to account for a better region. I mean, we're in, in a diverse uh, social works, I mean, from building houses to uh, cultural uh, exhibits. Uh, but also, I believe that, uh, that education is one issue that happens in all of, all of our countries. You know, we need to help in changing the models of education that, that, that are very old. We need to get technology in, in, in the education uh, rooms in the, in the schools. Because with, with good education, uh, I believe that we're going to get, obviously, good talent to work for our companies. But also, we're going to get a better region and people better prepared can generate not expecting to be hired by the, by, the, by the big companies, but also starting their own startups. So that, that, that going on, they can be hiring one or five or ten people. So I believe that uh, uh, social responsibility in, in Mexico and in this region is very important. So that's another common denominator that I find in, in, in these companies. Um, let me just add, we've heard many good reasons um, for having values and responsibility and actually carrying out projects because the projects show what your values are. That church example is a wonderful example, your activities in Mexico, what we heard from Dubai, etc. One of the questions that was posed for this session was, so how do the old players work with the emerging champions? And that's also a meeting point because often to accomplish things for the country, that requires partnerships from the established companies, the multinational companies, the emerging champions. And that's where the best relationships are forged, actually. That's where business partners begin to work together to change the world. It solidifies a business partner partnership. And um, that's a point of cooperation even among competitors. So I know that many of you in different ways also work with it within your industries with competitors. I know Semex um, does. Semex has been a force in the construction industry for getting greener standards um, in the industry. So you also have many roles to play, and all of those roles solidify relationships that in, can improve the industry and also improve the context for established players too. Ashwin Dani, Asian Paints, Bombay. It is very, very important uh, when you negotiate uh, with any foreign company and when particularly you have a 50-50 equity venture, uh, you really run into some stumbling blocks in signing the agreements because of the different uh, cultural values that you ultimately have to agree. And I must share one particular experience that we underwent. Uh, we underwent 50-50 uh, joint venture with PPG of USA on automotive coatings. Now, uh, uh, it is a laid down rule in PPG that uh, even a paint foreman of General Motors, if he bumps into senior uh, uh, sales representative of PPG by accident flight getting late at the airport and they bump into McDonald's restaurant, PPG fellows is not allowed to buy a, even a meal costing maybe three dollars or three and a half dollars for uh, his customer that is GM uh, foreman and uh, they uh, when we had to sign the joint venture agreement they said that 
these are the rules of PPG and you will have to strictly adhere to all this, then only we will proceed with the joint venture. Now it is very, very customary in India to buy a meal between the vendor and the customer and we said, no, we, we protest your policy and we will not sign the agreement. And believe it or not, negotiations were stalled for one month and ultimately uh, we signed the agreement with PPG saying that we sign it because we want the joint venture to proceed, but we sign it under protest. And this is how we signed the agreement. So on, our venture has been going on for nine years and it has worked very well. We have become an almost number one paint company for automotive OEM, OEM and refinish together. And we have excellent relationship. And this is the only venture PPG has outside of USA where they come with 50-50 equity partnership. So this is also at times you have a difficulty. You still want to be honest to yourself. You want to stick to your values. But this is how you find a compromise. Culture again, Mr. Nani, as I could see. Uh, I've been told that uh, we are uh, running out of uh, time. And if I may uh, quickly sum up uh, just in a few sentences. We have discussed a whole lot of things. Uh, uh, but clearly uh, what I find is that uh, the emerging champions have something different. And uh, maybe uh, we have missed it in uh, the established players. Maybe it is there. But uh, firstly, I find that uh, they want to do much more than uh, do something for themselves, the company. Uh, in Mr. Gargavi's case, it was not only uh, Dubai Inc., uh, not only the city, not only the state, but going beyond the region. Uh, some from uh, some aspects from a social uh, conscience, some for very sound reasons, in the sense you want stability in the region and, uh, region and so on. And I think almost every other uh, company here uh, then has the larger interest of uh, the mass uh, in their countries uh, where they're operating, whether it is their home country or the host countries that they've gone out to at heart. And very quickly, they've adapted to this. I think it, this is what uh, makes uh, uh, probably the probably poses the biggest competitive threat. And uh, I will go away from here with a question in my mind. Uh, are the new emerging champions you know, rethinking models? Are they thinking on different lines which uh, established players did not think on? And uh, to underscore that was uh, James, who said that we clearly had a philosophy of making profit, but X years back, we rethought it. And this is now our vision. This is how we have set it. This is, what we want, this is how we want to go about it. I think, uh, to me, it appears there is indeed a paradigm shift that is happening. Along with the paradigm shifts that have happened in the technology context, in the way you can leverage uh, you know, people, the way, the way you can leverage competencies, you know, disruption strategies, and so on, I think there is also a change of heart. And I think, to me, that is the true paradigm shift. And if that can be leveraged, I think, indeed, uh, the new champions will stay champions till somebody then uh, discovers a new way to, uh, to disrupt this good, socially good strategy. Thank you very much. And uh, this was an outstanding panel.